here today. It's so good to look out in this audience and see all of you here. Uh, my soul is thrilled uh, just to be here. Amen. I can't think of anywhere else I'd rather be right now than right here with the saints. Amen. We come together to lift up our hearts and our voices in praise. Amen. Rendering unto God expressions of thanksgiving yes. as we acknowledge who He is and what He does in our lives. So thank you for being here today. Thank God Amen. for being here today. I want to send glad tidings from Mr. and Mrs. U.B. Harris, yes. who was uh, who were united in matrimony on yesterday in Nashville, Tennessee, and we had a wonderful time. We, a few of us went down, the Murphys, the, the Coopers, and myself, we went down. Uh, to encourage them uh, in this journey together. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And I often say the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because the Apostles spake and they performed as they were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it was under the, uh, the superintendent of the Holy Spirit that they were able to accomplish all the things that they accomplished to the glory of God. Again, we've been looking at a theme, the theme of uh, giving God my all in all. Yeah. And this is all about making sure that when we uh, have lived this life, we've left it all on the field. You know, many times people die long before they are buried. Stay with me on that. Today I want to help us to embrace uh, more readily our purpose for being not only alive, but being members of the body of Christ. You see, someone once said that the church, church is a team sport. Church is a team sport. And every believer has a role to play in order that the church might be that effective witness. That effective witness that God requires of us. Amen. Church of the team sport. We must work together Amen. if we're going to accomplish all the things that God has created and purposed us to accomplish. Amen. And let me just say this to you, all of you with love in my heart. You see, I love you guys. And I want you to know that we are the family of God. Amen. Can you say that with me? We are the family of God. And as such, we must understand our purpose and role in the family uh, in, order that, uh, in order to realize the challenging and compelling mission that Jesus has left for all of us to accomplish. We understand that Jesus effectively and effectively carried out his Rolled on the earth. Amen. That's why he was able to say in the 17th chapter of the gospel, according to John, Father, I've glorified you on the earth by accomplishing the work that you've given me to accomplish. Right. And so we see Jesus now as he has counseled with his disciples. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts the first chapter. Acts the first chapter. Now, the specific context is going to be verses 6 through 8. Verses 6 through 8. But I want to show in this lesson that our works and our words will combine. You notice our works and our words. It's interesting what Jesus said, or what the Bible says about Jesus, in the first verse of Acts chapter 1. Again, we understand that uh, this book is a continuation of the gospel according to Luke. We see that the book of Acts takes up where Luke leaves off. And so it's in this verse that the writer, Luke, he's saying the former treaties I have made, O Theophilus, of all that, and watch this now, all that Jesus began both to what? Do. To do and what? Teach. And teach. Both to do and to teach. This is powerful. Don't miss this. Because the church uh, will be the church when we model the very mandates, 
the very principles that Jesus lived and walked by. Jesus, what he began to do and to teach. Now, how many of you have ever looked into a pond or a stream or a puddle of water? And what did you see when you peered into that puddle or that pond? You saw yourself, right? No, you saw a reflection of yourself. <laughs> you saw a reflection of yourself. And so therefore, uh, just as that pond mirrored the image that looked into that pond, Jesus now stands with his disciples as he has risen triumphantly from the grave. Now he has appeared to them. Uh, see, Jesus didn't finish his work uh, when he died on the cruel cross of Calvary. The Bible tells us that he was buried and he rose again the third day. And then after that, he had a retreat of 40 days with his chosen few. And he continued to teach and to uh, direct and encourage them. And now, and now he is at the very, the pinnacle of history where Jesus is ready to ascend and go back to be with the Father. He brings those special and special group of men together and he began to, according to Acts chapter 1, he began to give them final instructions. The Bible said all the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he not rose from the dead, but the day he was taken up into heaven. And to whom he, he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, sharing things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then, it's at this time he makes a statement. Because of those <coughs> apostles, those chosen few, had some misconceptions that needed to be, needed to be ironed out before they would be able to go under the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming his message to the masses. Notice, this purpose is for us to understand all the things that Jesus did. And if we are to be that reflection of Christ, we need to be noticed for the things that we both do and what? And teach. It was Jesus who said the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. And if that was Jesus' prime objective, what ought to be our prime objective? Right. To seek and to save that which is lost. From an evangelistic standpoint, we must go forth as powerful witnesses to the world. You see, if we're going to capture the attention and the hearts of all souls for the kingdom of God, it's going to be a result of us looking just like Jesus. It's going to be the result of us mirroring Jesus. It's going to be because we uh, are following the very pattern that he has set forth for us. Notice, the implications of this message is designed to touch and, and, and take hold of Every member of this congregation, from the pulpit to the parking lot, this message is for us, all of us. Uh, we must realize that in order to proclaim his message to the masses, we must embrace our role and responsibility as kingdom children. As children in God's kingdom, the kingdom of glory, just as uh, the body is one with different parts or components. Uh, the church has different members, different gifts and abilities, and therefore we must utilize those gifts and abilities as we come together and work together. I said that church is a team sport. We must work together in order to be triumphant and successful in discharging our duties as, 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 as members of the family of God. Notice our theme has everything to do with faithful stewardship over the things that God has entrusted to us. Now we said that by definition, stewardship 
or a steward is simply someone who has been placed, uh, has been, has been given uh, oversight and management over things that belong to another. In other words, the steward does not own the property. The steward has been charged with the responsibility of properly managing the property that belongs to someone else. Right? right? right. And so guess what? God has entrusted to us the souls of lost humanity. The souls don't belong to us. They belong to God. But you see, we as stewards have been given the responsibility to seek and to save the lost. We've been given responsibility to be that ambassador, that witness, that witness to the kingdom of God. So the question is, how do we glorify God? Through our witness. Back in this text, back in this text, we find that uh, these disciples, noticing the dynamic impact of what's going on right before their eyes, the resurrected Savior, who not too long ago said, Behold, and, and, and my hands and my feet and the, my side, and know that I am indeed risen from the dead. Can you imagine these disciples sitting around his feet, uh, learning from him, hearing his message, the, the, the question that's in their mind? And, and even in the text, it bears out, they have a question. And the question is, okay, God, uh, Jesus, we've been waiting to ask you this for a long time. You know, everything is lining up now. We understand exactly what this thing is all about. Uh, tell us one thing. We've been itching to uh, ask you this question. And they being assembled together. Uh, he began to tell them that they're not to depart uh, from Jerusalem. They are to wait until they receive a special endowment by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once they receive this special uh, endowment, then they are going to be uh, dispatched into the world. Yeah. But notice in verse 6, it says, When they therefore were come together, they asked him. Now notice, it wasn't, you know, Peter asked, or John asked. He said, they asked. They had come together. They were, they were all in agreement to this question. They came and they began to put this uh, question to him. And they said, Lord, will thou at this time, we've been waiting on this, is, is this the time that you are going to uh, restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, two things when you look at that. You know, look at you know to understand what's going on. All this time, in terms of uh, sway, influence, and control of the people, the scribes and the Pharisees, you know, you know, and the Sadducees, they were the ruling class. And after all the things that Jesus had done to debunk uh, the message and the heart of the religious right, if you will, of the day. Now they're saying, now when you when you go back to the Father, surely you're not going to leave everything in the kingdom in the hands of these folk. <laughs> the very folk who you have been rebuking and exposing for their uh, false motives and methodologies, surely you're not going to leave everything to them. Another view could be is this a time when you're going to restore uh, Israel to the glory days, reminiscent of the days of, of David and Solomon, of Asa and Jehoshaphat? Back in those old days when everything seemed to be blossoming for the nation, we were not under Roman rule, but we were a prized kingdom in and of ourselves. And Jesus had to straighten them out because the kingdom that Jesus was advocating was not a kingdom of this earth. No, we're not going back to the good old days of David and Solomon. We're not going, your best days are ahead of you. This kingdom that I'm talking about is a heavenly kingdom. It's a heavenly rule. See, the word kingdom in and of itself is the word basileia. It simply means the rule of God. 
God is sovereign. He rules everything. And now the kingdom, the kingdom is going to be coming down to men. And we'll have entrance into that glorious kingdom that we call the ecclesia or the church. Now, I stated that this has implications from the pulpit to the parking lot. That we understand that every one of us has a role to play. Notice, notice evangelistic stewardship. For Jesus said, you shall be my what? My witnesses. How then do we become an effective and faithful witness to the world? If the world is going to know that we are indeed the children of God. If the world is going to know that we pack a powerful punch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the church packs a powerful punch. And the people are going to feel the impact of that. It's going to be because of our dedication and devotion to the kingdom principles. If indeed we're a kingdom people, we must live according to the ethics of the kingdom. Notice evangelistic stewardship. I said it starts from the pulpit. Well, I can't preach this to you if I don't preach it to me. You know, and when I say evangelistic, it's much more than just uh, being able to stand in this position and proclaim the message. You know, many of us uh, are called to preach and to teach the Word of God. And everybody, you may not be the herald, uh, the karooks, or, or, or the herald of the message. But that does not mean that we don't have a responsibility to proclaim this message in other ways. For Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. We need to become creative in understanding and determining just how God wants to use me in the greatest enterprise known to mankind. He didn't leave it just to a select few folk. No, the whole church has a role and responsibility in this endeavor. That's right. Ah, but I want to start with the preacher. The great responsibility of preaching and teaching the gospel is, is foundational to an effective witness. We're not proclaiming the word uh, in truth and with power. Uh, then, how can we be effective in, 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 in persuading lost humanity to repent and come to Christ? To preach the gospel is to save souls. And that does not imply that there's any power in Genome to save. That's why the Bible says in Romans 1, I'm not ashamed, not of the preacher, but of the gospel. You see, it is the message that we proclaim. You see, the gospel, this message, a message about this Savior who we talk about, and all he began to do and to teach, this message is indeed powerful enough uh, to save and rescue lost humanity from the bondage of sin. We have to believe that. Do you believe that the word of God is powerful enough uh, to save lives? Do you believe that the gospel is powerful enough to transform lives? We have to understand the potency of the word of God. See, the word of God is powerful. The Bible says the living is, is quick. It's alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to know your thoughts, uh, even though you may smile in folks' face. The Word of God is able to discern your thoughts, knows your heart, and will reveal, will reveal to you just where you are, in spite of where you think you are. To the Word of God, you can't play with it. It's the, it's, it's the power a salvation because it reveals the righteousness of God that we may live by faith. Notice another dimension of this message. This message has the ability to correct the error in our ways. As we go through life, we encounter different uh, philosophies. We encounter different people uh, that don't necessarily share your understanding of the Word of God. And in su as such, we are constantly bombarded by uh, 
philosophy even, uh, different ideologies, and different uh, ways of thinking. If the child of God is not on point and firm in his faith, we can easily find ourselves being pulled and drawn to teachings that are not uh, congruous with or in harmony with the teachings of the Word of God. Amen. So therefore, uh, number one, the preacher or teacher or anyone who would dare to be a faithful and effective witness, first of all, we must not become entangled, entangled with life's affairs. If you're going to be entangled with anything, be entangled with the ministry of the Word of God. Amen. Too often we get caught up and sidetracked because we have, we're pursuing other interests and other, uh, other uh, allurements in life. But we must have the Word of God as first and foremost in our hearts and minds. Why? Because the God we serve is first and foremost in our minds. <coughs> you cannot glorify God effectively if you are you know, spending all your time chasing other things. Then put that in your pocket. We also must have a sense of urgency, yet. A sense of urgency. How? How urgent? And how pressing is your desire to share your faith? How pressing? Is it, how passionate are you? How passionate are you about expressing to others the goodness of God? Or how casual are we about this whole thing? Because I think we become so casual in our commitment to God. You know, I can't wait to get over here and do this or get over there and do that. But never get around to giving 100% effort to the things uh, to the, that pertain to the kingdom. And I'm just saying this is an urgency is because lost souls are, are, are dying every day. Every day there are funerals. Every day we're getting a phone call talking about someone who's dead to us. And if we are not, if we don't have a sense of urgency, those folks will just go straight to the grave. How many people are within your personal influence? How many people who you have sway over? And how are you prayerfully attempting to position yourself in order that you may uh, share the good news of Jesus Christ with them? Everything that we do, every relationship we have, we need to make sure that God is uniquely positioning us so that we can, uh, through our life and modeling, have opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Talking about passion now. Talking about commitment. Talking about a sense of urgency. You see, uh, we must preach to help people see the crucified Christ. Brother Merriweather, you can't preach just to show people the preacher. It's not about exhibitionism. It's not about personal agenda. It's not about you in the, the, the pulpit pit as a platform for personal attack. You catch me doing that, you know, let me know. I don't have a line of one back in my office. So. <laughs> but the point is, we preach Christ and Him crucified. Yeah, that's right. We preach Christ and Him crucified. That needs to be the, the thing. Now, what does that mean? It means that we need to take heed to our saying. The Bible says over there in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 16, it says, Take heed to yourself. Take heed unto yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in those things. For in doing that, you will what? Uh, ensure salvation both to yourself and to those who hear you. Amen. We need to make sure that you know, the, the, the message that we proclaim is the message that we need. Right. From the pulpit to the parking lot. Right. Every one of us in here who dare name the name of Jesus, we must not only proclaim a message, but endeavor to live that message. For the Bible said, you know, Paul said, if I come or I was absent, I would hear that you are uh, proclaiming a message and living by that message. That you live a life that is worthy of the gospel. Right. 
In other words, if you claim to be a Christian, then what? You ought to act like it. Amen. And the more we act like Christians, the more we walk like Christians, the more we talk like Christians, the more folk will believe that you are a Christian. Amen. It means careful preparation. It means faithful living. Faithful preaching. Uh, what thus says the Lord. It's prophetic preaching. In other words, we're always helping people to understand what's going on in their life right now. And then take that and point it to, point it to the triumphant return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We want to make sure that everybody's ready. Are you ready to see Jesus when he comes? Are you ready? See, we, we need to make sure we're ready. It's not about I think I'm ready. I hope I'm ready. Oh, I hope I'm in that number. No, we need to know. We need to live a life of readiness. You know, being prepared. So therefore we preach and teach, pointing them to the cross, pointing them to heaven. And therefore we become effective and relevant to where people are right now in their everyday experience. See, practical preaching is providing instruction, providing a how-to manual in terms of how we live our life right now. You know, we don't want to be so heavenly bound that we know it's good, right? right? So not only are we prophetically pointing them uh, to glory, while we're on our way to glory, there's some things you need to be doing right now in your everyday experience that is going to prepare you for that. In other words, your faith must be practical. Your living needs to be real and relevant to what's going on in every circumstance. Because people, people are not necessarily interested in hearing another sermon. They can't hear the sermon because of how loud their stomachs may be grounded. That's why Jesus fed uh, the multitude. And then he had a good audience. Maybe they wanted us for dessert. <laughs> but the point is, the point is we must always Find out how we can meet people where they are. The Apostle Paul said, I've become all things to all men. In other words, uh, to the weak, I became as weak. Uh, to the Jew, I became as a Jew. To the Gentile, as a Gentile. To, to, it does not matter. I'm going to make sure that I can uh, empathize or relate to where they are and meet them. Meet them where they are. See, many times we want the, the people in the world to come to the church. But notice what Jesus did. Jesus went to the people. He went to the people. And then as he went to the people and he began to do and to teach, then people began to seek out where he was. People will seek you out. People will want to know where you're going. People want to know where you live, where you worship, when they see the authentic Jesus in you. See, that's the challenge for us today. To make sure that we're glorifying God through our witness. And in order to glorify God through our witness, we must be uh, as one who looks in to the pond and see the reflection. We need, we need to see, look in the pond and see Jesus. Not to see ourselves, but to see Jesus. Do you reflect Christ? Amen. That's the point. We want to reflect Christ. So when we, we reflect Christ, then people will be drawn to God uh, through us. Opposed to be drawn to us, but to Christ through us. Amen. See, evangelistic responsibility is for me and everyone who will preach and teach his word, but also for everyone in the church. We have an evangelistic role by just living a life out loud. Living a life that proclaims that we are a transformed people. Amen. We are a purposeful people. We are people who have been impacted. Uh, by the grace of God. Now that we have been impacted by the grace of God, we're now living by the grace of God. Sharing with others how they can be invited to the party. Amen. Great invitation says, Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And if we receive rest, we need to also invite others into that rest. Amen. Not only do we see evangelistic stewardship, but there's also pastoral, pastoral stewardship. In other words, not only do we proclaim a message that brings salvation to lost souls, but then what are we doing to exercise care over those who are already saved? 
They're the great responsibility of the church. And what is their responsibility? In providing care to and for those redeemed children of God. Just because you have come into the church doesn't mean that you're not hurting anymore. Just because you've obeyed the gospel does not mean that you are immune from life and life's circumstances. We still feel pain. We still have uh, unmet expectations. We still get hurt. We still uh, receive forms of discomfort. We are still going through storms in our lives. Jesus didn't promise that you know, we would have no more struggles, no more trials. That all the storm clouds will just vanish away once you obey the gospel? No. But he did promise that I will give you rest. And the church becomes a haven. A haven of rest. Folk on the outside who are getting uh, drenched by the storm ought to be able to come in to the church and find refuge. They ought to be able to come into the church and find peace. They ought to come to the church and find tranquility. They ought to be able to come to the church and find this is where I want to be. Amen. So therefore, when uh, folk are in the church, uh, we still hurt. So there is something called pastoral care that must be administered to folk who are saved and thus closing the back door so we don't have this recidivism or just coming in the front door and going out the back. You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we have so many missing in action, prisoners of war, that we have more folk outside in the church on a Sunday morning than we do inside. I'm just saying, pastoral care is a great responsibility in the church. That's why the Bible talks about bishops, you know, those who have oversight. He talks about the same person from a, a, a pastoral component. He calls them shepherds. Those who are tending the flock. Talks to them, he refers to them as elders. Those who have, uh, not, not so much as how long you live, but how well those lives have been, the last have been lived. Amen. And those individuals come together and they perform a unique service to the church. Amen. Bishops are charged with oversight and stewardship. Again, stewardship of souls that are not their souls. They're God's souls. Man. And they have been given this, this very uh, unique and uh, powerful, I will use the word burdensome, responsibility mm -hmm. to care, to care for the lost souls or the, the souls of the saved. Man. You see, when we create that kind of healthy environment when saved folk are now being instructed on how to act like they saved, Man. to live like they're saved, yeah. to be able to enjoy abundant and full and fruitful lives in God, then others will be attracted. Yes, Man. The pastoral component of the church is very important. Man. It's very important that we're providing care to those who are still bruised and still uh, broken and those who are still uh, being enticed and pulled and tempted by Satan. The children of God and the local church, they need, they need care and they need oversight. Notice what the Bible says over in Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, the Bible tells us, uh, in, in verse number 7, it says, For a bishop, <coughs> again, we remember all the things Jesus both began to do and to teach, right? It says, For a bishop must be blameless. Does that mean that he has not sinned? No. What does it mean? It simply means that this person is walking in a certain way. That there is not a harsh accusation that can be heralded at this person. Right. You know, I didn't see you, you know, down there shooting crap. Right, 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 right. And, and he's not that kind of guy. <laughs> One who blames you just can't. If you did throw an accusation, it would take a lot of convincing for folk to believe it's true. Amen. Amen. Someone promotes gospel about you. Doesn't it take a long time to convince somebody if it's true or not? Right. <laughs> Yeah, he said, yeah, I saw Brother Rebel. Like, yeah, I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just like him. No, no, no. A bishop must be one who lives himself uh, circumspectly. He lives himself in a certain way that people, they observe him and know that that's not his character. Amen. That's not his lifestyle. So he won. He's one who's blameless as a steward or a manager. 
minister in behalf of God. Not self-willed. Not soon angry. Not given to wine. Not a striker. Not given to filthy lucre. In other words, his motivations are kingdom motivations. See, sometimes we do and say certain things under the wrong motivation. What's your motivation? What's your reason for being? What's your reason for aspiring to certain positions? Mm -hmm. You see, now, let me just say this. When we look at qualifications, mm -hmm. when we look at qualifications, I think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice. Because we look at qualifications uh, from the wrong vantage point. And what I mean by that is, I'm not minimizing the significance and importance of qualifications, but what I am slamming is how we use those qualifications. Come on. Understand this, that these qualifications are qualifications that every believer, every person who's a child of God should strive Amen. to be this kind of person. Amen. How many of us don't have to look like Jesus? How many of us are not to mature and grow? So when you talk about these quote-unquote qualifications, historically, many times we've used this as a checklist as to why folk cannot become an elder or a deacon or whatever. Right. Help us now. But the Bible put these there as a, uh, 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 a portrait for us to look at. And for all these youngsters around here, Amen. you know, as they begin to Amen. see the godly lives of others who are now uh, in those roles, they said, I want to grow up to be just like that. Amen. And I begin to look at the word of God and begin to tell me how I ought to act. I want to be uh, this kind of person because that's the kind of person who looks like Jesus. Yes, sir. And the more we get people uh, who look like Jesus, the more powerful our witness. Amen. So these, these bishops, these elders, these shepherds, pastors, if you will, are to be models. Amen. To be models Please. of God the living. That's right. Not that we have to be, the, they, you have to be, you know. <laughs> so, well, I, I don't get the qualifications, but I'm going to hit this big sin, living the kind of way I want to live, but I'm not trying to be one. <laughs> missed it. Help us. We missed it. <laughs> right over our head. Every, every believer wants to live a life that qualifies him as an effective witness for Jesus. Amen. And the more we look at those models, those men and women who have striven to be just that, we can begin to latch on. That's why Paul said, follow me right. as, as I follow Christ. Right. In other words, I put myself on front street. I, I, I bring my own life under subjection. I buffet my body. I, I make sure that I divorce myself of all those worldly pursuits so that I can be a, a good role model for those who are coming behind me so they can want to be like the Jesus that they see in me. Amen. And so there we are. Pastoral functions of elders uh, uh, and pastors are to feed, lead, and care for the flock. Over in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28, it talks about uh, the feed the, the, the church of God. Feed the church of God. When she first used with her own blood. Amen. We've been given the oversight. Uh, the pastoral oversight. That's why it's important for the church to, to uh, teach healthy teaching so that they can raise up men who are desirous of, uh, who fit the bill of a shepherd or a pastor. Amen. Here at the Vine Street Church of Christ, yes. we need to move in that direction. Amen. We need to be made, trying to live a life uh, that glorifies God. And in doing so, the people begin to see and recognize various qualities and attributes. And then we put those people forward. And they begin to exercise spiritual discernment and maturity Amen. as they help to navigate uh, from a pastoral context uh, the church. We need to make sure that we are taking care of our church. And we need to serve joyfully and not out of grief. We need to serve willingly and not by constraint. We need to lead by influence and not by insistence. See, we Come on now. Come on. I don't have time to deal with that. All right. See, uh, see, one thing about a shepherd that is a telltale sign of uh, their discharging of their duty 
See, the shepherd has a smell. There's a certain odor to a shepherd. And you know what the shepherd smells like? He smells like sheep. All right. In other words, being a shepherd is not some in some back room making all these decisions about what we're gonna what the church will know. It's about being among the people. Man. The shepherd, the flock. Yeah. Providing guidance and influence. Leading by example and not by exasperation. Oh. In other words, you lead by example and not by guilt tripping. Not by, you know, talking down on this folk. All right. It's all about lifting people up Amen. and not beating people down. Amen. It's about making sure folk are edified. Making sure that we're moving in the right direction and everyone is able to experience the joy of being a Christian. It's good to be a saint. It's good to be alive in the body of Christ. And I say that because sometimes we act like we're dead in the body of Christ. Come on. See, a good shepherd is responsible for watching over the flock. And that means we have to be patient. We have to be patient with one another. And this is difficult because everyone is not where you are. That's yeah. right. Matter of fact, many of you are not where you think you are. That's right. <laughs> We're not there. None of us have arrived. And therefore, we need to understand and have that sensitivity as we deal with other people with patience, provide care and concern. Man. Another thing is important. We just need to strive to have accurate, accurate knowledge of the Word of God. Man. How can you teach someone something that you don't know? Man. How can you lead someone in a direction that you won't go? All right. we, we need to make sure that we are from a pastoral. If you notice, a shepherd, he leads his sheep into pasture. Man. And his sheep follow him because they hear and recognize his voice. Amen. See, a shepherd doesn't lead from behind. He leads from, from in front. Must be among the flock in order to lead the flock. You see, a faithful elder, or faithful elders, let me put that Amen. in plural, Amen. are precious in the sight of God as they stand guard to protect and to guide the church in the path of righteousness. But also, let me say this in closing. There's something called evangelistic stewardship, pastoral stewardship. But there is congregational stewardship. Amen. In other words, we share a responsibility, and thus we shall all be held accountable. Mm -hmm. Don't think you're getting away with anything. Mm -hmm. For we shall be accountable for the soul within our sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. Everyone in here, it doesn't matter how young or old you are. Everyone has a sphere of influence. Every one of us has individuals who God has positioned in our lives. Amen. And therefore, as we have opportunity, we are to impact their lives for good. It's a Christian's duty to try to win souls to God's arms. Can you imagine where you would be if someone did not take the time to invest in you. Right. Think about how you came to Christ. Mm -hmm. Whether you had a family that you were in that were a God-fearing family, or whether someone impressed upon you the importance. Maybe you had a friend, a spouse, someone who you knew. Maybe someone gave you a flyer and pointed you in a direction. Mm -hmm. But all of us are here as a result of somebody else Man. taking time to share something with you pertaining to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we, we understand that we must constantly seek opportunity to share our faith. Right. Again, Jesus said that the Son of Man came to seek and to save. That means the intentional pursuit of lost people. Amen. What is the intentionality in our efforts? We have to be intentional, folk. Amen. See, we just don't haphazardly share our faith. Yeah. We don't just, you know, it's, it's not some coincidental thing. I'm reminded of how Philip encountered that Ethiopian as he was going back home from Jerusalem. Uh -huh. God gave him an opportunity. Right. God 
gives you an opportunity throughout your day. See, you know, he could have just been passing on the, on the chariot and just kept on going. Isn't that how we sometimes do? As we go through life, we pass and encounter people. And we may have an opportunity to do or say or be or whatever the case may be. And we let that, and we just go right on by. Right on about our business. Not even recognizing that an opportunity had just presented itself. See, we need to be spiritually in tune to God's agenda. Amen. That doesn't mean that you flag down everybody who you pass by. Right. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about you. I don't want to go there. Sorry. But it does mean that we are spiritually in tune with the Spirit of God. It means that spiritually we're in tune with the Spirit of God to the point that we recognize opportunity and we will see opportunity. We are ready. Well, I had an opportunity. Come on, let's hear Brother Mary, what is the first record I want you to teach you now? It's about all of us understanding how God has uniquely positioned us to be effective in sharing our faith with others. That's right. As we seek our opportunity, we, we also constantly seek to restore those who are erring. Uh -huh. In James chapter 5 and 19, it talks about us, there be some among you who err, right. who err from the truth, therefore turn back. I want you to know how vital your role is in, 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 in responsibility is to that person. Right. Understand that a person who converts a sinner uh, uh, from the error of his way saves a soul from death and covers a multitude of sins. Right. So in other words, when, when, when folks fall away, when folks begin to leave and, and, and be uh, entrapped and entangled and therefore pulled away, by the various devices of Satan, where is the church? Where are we? Some people you had been friends with, had unique relationships with, and when they go on, we need to go and, and, and pursue them. If a person who's a shepherd has a hundred sheep and he lose one, does he not leave the 99 and go and pursue that one that is caught out there in the thicket, who is vulnerable to the wolves, who's vulnerable to the devices of Satan, and we go and we bring them back, and when you find them, you pull them out. If he's caught on the brush, you put him out of that sinful situation. See, sometimes we get caught up in the throne of life, the sinful behaviors and activities in the world, and we get trapped and take, and guess what? I want to get out. But sometimes I can become weak. I can become so ensnared and entangled. I can't get out. That's when the shepherd comes with that big old stash. And he reaches in there and he pulls them out. We need some folk around here who can pull some folk out. Out of the fire. Notice, not only do we restore, but it's through living faithfully before others that gives power to your witness. The power of your witness is best seen in a transformed life. Does that make sense to you? A transformed life speaks louder than any stringing of passages and that type of thing. I can string up a whole lot of passages. But if my life, if my life is just in shambles, if I'm living a hypocrisy, a hypocritical life, well then, you know, it dilutes the effectiveness of the message. Not that the gospel does not have power. It's that people, first of all, got to get past me. See, sometimes there's too much Gino in the way, but then they hear the message of Christ. Sometimes there's so, too much you in the way, and folk can't hear what you have to say because they're so detracted by your lifestyle, Amen. by your inconsistency, Amen. by your self-serving motives. Amen. And folk can see that. Let me just leave you with this. Just as we look in that pond and we are to see the reflection of Christ, everybody has parental responsibility as well. Because we are all children of God. The Bible gives us the model of a parent-child relationship. Modeling godly principles before demanding godly behavior. In other words, we teach the word by example. Mm -hmm. There have been so many uh, who have preached a good sermon, but lives have not lived in such a way that their children see them. Amen. And they see, wait a minute, well, I heard what you said, but I'm seeing how you live. Right. See, my daughter... My daughter was talking about, you know, how somebody was kind of messing with them at school. And, you know, I'm, 
I'm the parents. <laughs> if somebody hits you, you hit them. <laughs> uh, don't let nobody run over you. <laughs> I'm trying to protect my daughter. If somebody hits you, you hit them back. And you know what she said to me? Oh, daddy. <laughs> just kind of just flew with me. Out of my house of bed, oh, daddy. She understands what she's been hearing about in Bible class. She hear about what I'm preaching about. And then I come up and tell her, wait a minute, forget all that. <laughs> when you get on the playground, you got to have these offenses. I'm just saying. Uh, how you deal with it? Yeah, I need some counseling. Help me. You guys who've been through that. I don't know if there's any kind of advice. <laughs> but I'm just simply saying, we need to model before our children. Right. You know, we can, we can live a life and save other folks and lose our own, our own family. Pray to God for wisdom in how we rear them. And when I talk about this, I'm using this parent-child relationship as an example of the broader context as how we ought to act with one another. We're like that with one another. Just as you teach your, teach your children to be soul winners from an early age. Guess what? Those who are not in Christ, those who are in the world are trying to teach them to be worldly. Why don't we teach our children to convert the worldly folk. Right. See, the church needs to be on the offensive. We need to be aggressive. We need to just not right. be in protection mode. Right. We need to be in advancing mode. We need to be that army that conquers. That you know, the gates of hell should not prevail against the onslaught of the church. Right. And so that's what we ought to be. You know, we're scared to send our kids to school because they might be in. Well, wait a minute. No, we, we ought to train our children so wherever they go, they are the influencers. Hey. Opposed to being the influence. Right. We got our children going away and, and getting just so seduced by the world that their lives don't have an opportunity to fully blossom and grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Again, in closing, we want to glorify God through our witness. And that is that we begin, the people will know us by the things that we both do and teach. And as we do that, we attract souls to us that we may now present them to Jesus, to the glory of God. Amen. If you're here today, and you are not a member of the body of Christ, understand that Jesus is wooing you right now through his spirit and through his word of uh, coming in contact with your spirit is changing you, helping you to understand that you need to be converted. You need to be transformed and translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. He wants you to be a part of this grand army and all your believers who understand the full import of what it means to glorify God through giving God my all in all. And making sure that my witness is such the people, we lift up the character of Christ. For Jesus said, if I be lifted up through your lives, I'll draw all men unto me. Help me to lift up Jesus today. Help me to lift up Jesus. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, you need to all obey the gospel. You need to understand that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried and rose again on the third day. Powerfully triumphant over death and the grave. And he gives you that very victory through your obedience to the gospel. Understanding that when you trust God for your salvation, it's going to manifest itself in you dying to sin and being walked, buried in the watery grave of baptism. And just as Jesus, when he died, he didn't stay dead. He got up from the grave. Therefore, you have the power to rise and walk in a new life, a resurrected life. A life of power. Amen. Confessing to be Lord, be buried in the water and grave of baptism for the remission of your sins. And that puts you in the family of God. And then, and then, you'll be a part of God's army. Amen. Let's go out and do what we got to do. And have my business. Think about that as a guy who's standing and sing a song of encouragement.